Can everybody hear me? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to apologize ahead of time and get emotional. It's been an emotional period in my life. Uh, three weeks ago, I was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. It has spread my liver. And at that time, my wife had heard from the doctor that I had three weeks and three months left to live. We had more tests and they confirmed the same thing. Tuesday this week we met with an oncologist and he told me that my cancer is real fast growing and I probably have two weeks to six weeks left to live. I'm here tonight to share two messages with you. <clears throat> One is uh, a message about sharing Christ with others. And the other one is a message about how to receive Christ for yourself if you haven't done that yet. Uh, Billy doesn't know this, but I used to live on 25th in Portland. So I know this neighborhood. I know where y'all are from. And I want to commission you tonight. To go into this neighborhood, take some of the stuff I share with you and share Christ with your friends and neighbors. Not only do they need it, everybody in this world needs it. When we got the diagnosis, the first thing out of my mouth was, I have no fear. I have no fear whatsoever. I have no fear because I have Jesus. And I know where I'm going to spend the rest of my life. And that's not a life that started when I was born by my mother. That's a life that started the day I accepted Christ. And it's going to go for eternity. I have that assurance. So I'm not afraid at all. And for a lot of people, that creates confusion. God just gave me this scripture. I was sitting here praying like Cody was saying. And it's in 1 Corinthians, uh, the first chapter. I'm going to get through this. And Paul wrote this. He said, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. For it's written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolishness the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demanded miraculous signs. The Greeks looked for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than a man's strength. Brothers, I'm sorry, my fingers are dry. And so is my memory. It says, Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this, of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts boast in the Lord. 
my spiritual gift has been evangelism, and I've been evangelizing for the Lord for 50 years. I've been able to share with just about every kind of people that you can think of. I want to encourage you tonight, and I'm going to tell you a couple of stories to try to encourage you to get out into the world and share the gospel. I don't have much time left. I want to see somebody pick up my cross and go and tell the world. You know, for a long time, uh, there's a couple of verses that I had memorized very well. I knew them well. I know all the scripture around them well. But I never, never really had a full grasp of what they meant. One is Philippians 4, 7 where he says, God will give you the peace that passes all understanding and guard your hearts and mind to the Lord Jesus. And Romans 8, 28 says, we know that all things work to good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. I thought I knew what those verses meant. I can tell you today, I know what those verses mean. I know a peace that passes understanding. I can accept a diagnosis that I've got a very short time left. That, folks, is a piece that passes all understanding. That's a piece the world doesn't understand. It's just like the scripture that Paul preached 2,000 years ago. God uses the foolish things of the world for his honor and glory. I know those, I know that peace that passes all understanding. I know what the scripture means that all things work to the good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. I got a phone call last night from my brother. My younger brother's got three adopted kids. And one of them has lived a very troubled life since she was 12 and she's 19 now. She lived on the streets. Uh, she was uh, involved in drugs and prostitution and all kinds of things. And Jamie called me last night and said, I came home. And she wants to live here. And she's got some questions for you, Tom. Huh? She's got some questions about the Bible. And I asked what her questions were. And she said, I don't know, but I don't understand it. I don't understand the Bible. And I said, well, it makes sense to me and I because you can't understand it until you have the Holy Spirit. God said, Jesus said he'd send the Holy Spirit to be our counselor and our teacher. And uh, she said, well, I, I don't know what that is. And I said, let me walk you through a few steps. And I shared my testimony with her, and I want to share my testimony with you tonight. Before I do that, well, I'll just get into it. I'm a Vietnam vet, and uh, in about 1972, I was in Pensacola, Florida, and I was based with going to Vietnam. I was in the Navy, and I'm going to school to learn a job that they were going to have me doing the Navy. And one night I was walking down the hall in the barracks and uh, uh, an acquaintance came up. His name was Bob Roper. Uh, I knew him by his first name, but that's all I knew of him. And he said, hi, Tom. He said, where are you headed? And I said, I'm going down to the, the club on base. You know, the Navy believed that if you were old enough to die for your country, you were old enough to go into a bar and have a beer if you wanted to. And I was 19 at the time. And I said, I'm going over to the club on base to drink and listen to the band. And he said, why don't you come with me? And I said, where are you going? He said, I'm going downtown. I said, I can't, Bob. I'm not old enough. I'm only 19. You won't serve me in the bars. He said, Bob, I'm not going to a bar. I said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to go to a Christian outreach center. And I said, uh, you know, I, I think I'll go to the bar. He said, well, I'll tell you what, Tom. He said, they got pretty girls and they got home cooked food. And I said, you know, Bob, I could probably try it one time. <laughs> so I went with him down, and, uh, it was called The Happening. Uh, and I had a good time, I, I really did. And they had pretty girls, and they had home-cooked food, and they had, you know, we played pool and stuff. And towards the end of the evening, a fella got up and uh, gave about a 10-minute devotional time, and, and uh, he spoke on Micah 6.6 six through 6.8. Six, in Micah 6, 8 is my life verse. Does anybody know what Micah 6, 8 says? Don't worry. 
It's not a rhetorical question. I'll tell you, I'll give you the answer. It says, he showed you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And this guy, there was probably 40, 40 men there that night, and this guy came up to me afterwards and uh, greeted himself to me. And he asked me, he said, what's your name? And I told him, and he said, where are you from? And I told him, and he said, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. He said, Tom, are you a Christian? I said, yeah. He said, well, how do you know? I said, I'm not Jewish. He said, well, that doesn't make you a Christian. I said, well, no, but you know, I've gone to church. He said, that's good. It doesn't make you a Christian. I said, well, uh, my mom had me baptized. He said, oh, that's great. Doesn't make you a Christian. And I said, well, I went through these confirmation classes they had in the church. He said, Tom, you're telling me all good things to do, but none of them make you a Christian. And I'm like, all right, smart Alec, why don't you tell me what does? <clears throat> and he picked up the Bible, and he opened it, and he's going to start sharing verses with me. I said, hold it. You're sharing stuff with me out of a book that was written by men. What makes it right? He says, well, it says in there that God inspired them to tell us to write it. I said, yeah, but a guy who wrote that, he could have been wrong. And he looked at me and he said, you know, you're asking some pretty good questions. He said, I want to challenge you to try to figure out why the Bible's true. And I took him at his word. Now, this was before the internet. It was before a whole bunch of things we have today. Uh, you know, to use, a, to use a telephone, you had to <laughs> do this. And if you had a cell number, it was on a room with steel gates on it. <laughs> And uh, I, I started doing a bunch of research on the Bible, and I found four amazing facts that convinced me that the Bible was true. And I did, folks, I did not look to the Bible for those facts. The facts that I found were, do you know there's over 30,000 archaeological discoveries that directly relate to people, places, and events in the Bible? Not a single one is contradictory to Scripture. And over 40% of the Bible has been proven to be absolutely 100% accurate. And I said, okay, I get that part. That leaves 40 or 60% that's not proven. Do you know that over the last 2,000 years, men have been using every scientific method available to them? Some have spent their lifetimes and fortunes trying to find just one thing written in the Bible they could prove is false. Mm -hmm. Because if you could prove just one thing is false, you could say, this book is not true. It's got things in it that are not true, they're false. Mm -hmm. The third fact I found was the prophecies about Jesus. You know there's over 400 prophecies written over a 1,500 year period by over a dozen men. Mm. And every single one was fulfilled exactly the way they were written. Leaving the virgin birth aside, even today with our mode of transportation and everything, it'd be impossible to take a baby at birth and walk them through every one of those prophecies and fulfill them. Everyone except the last one was fulfilled the way it was written. And that's the one about Jesus' second coming, and he is returning. Yes. The fourth thing that really was the nail in the coffin was looking at the life of the disciples. There were 13 disciples. Now, everybody thinks there were 12. When Judas Iscariot betrayed Jesus, he felt guilty about it, and he hung himself. And the other 11 voted one more fellow in to be a disciple. Those 12 disciples, 11 of them died a martyr's death. And what a martyr's death is, uh, it's a horrible, torturous death only for what they believe. One of the disciples was hung upside down by his ankles, spread eagle like this, and they used a handsaw and started at his groin and sawed him in half alive. <clears throat> That's the type of death that they died. Eleven of them died that type of death. The twelfth one was the apostle, or was John, the disciple John, who wrote first, second, and third John and Revelation. And they tried to kill him by boiling him in oil, and it didn't kill him, so they stuck him on an island to live out the rest of his life, and he lived to ninety-two. You could maybe convince me that one of those guys would die for a lie, but not all of them. If they hadn't really seen Jesus rise from the dead after being crucified and walk the face of the earth, there's no way those guys would have went to that kind of a death. 
It just wouldn't have happened. And those four facts convinced me the Bible was true. So I went back to them because I was I had a curiosity now. There was a real chance that if I went to Vietnam that I would not come home alive. <laughs> So I went back and I said, tell me again, I believe the Bible is true, tell me again what it says about being a Christian. He said, well, Tom, let me ask you some questions. I said, okay. He said, have you ever told a lie? He put his hand up like this and says, or answer, even if it was to save somebody harm. And I said, well, you know, I probably did, but I'm sure it was only to save somebody harm. <laughs> he said, okay. He said, Tom, have you ever taken something that didn't belong to you? And I said, you mean steal? He said, yeah. I said, no. He said, really? You've never gone to the grocery store and wanted to buy grapes or cherries or gummy bears and wanted to try it before you bought them? Well, you know, yeah, I, you know, I like the red gummy bears the best. I said, I guess I probably have done that. He said, okay. He said, Tom, have you ever been mad, so mad at somebody, if you got a hold of them, you do physical harm? I said, well, you know, I have five brothers and sisters. He said, all right, he said, Tom, have you ever saw a pretty dress, a pretty girl in a short dress and had muscle thoughts? And I said, sure I have. He said, you know, based on your answers, you just admitted to me that you broke four of God's Ten Commandments. He said, don't be surprised because Romans 3.23 in the Bible says, everyone has sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. And he looked at me and he said, Tom, we have to die a physical death because of sin. He said, when God originally created Adam and Eve, his design was that they'd live forever. But because of sin, we have to die a physical death. But he said, there's another death we die as soon as we sin. And he said, that's a spiritual death. And that's an eternal separation between us and God. Because we, we serve a holy God and he cannot stand sin. And he said, you know, Tom, there is absolutely nothing that you can do to make up for that. If you live to sin this life from this point forward, the sin you committed prior to that will separate you from God for eternity, and there's nothing you can do about it. But Romans 6.23 goes on to say, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And I said, there you go. That proves I'm a Christian. He said, how's that? I said, well, because I believe this book is true now based on the facts, I believe Jesus is who he says he is, and he died for my sin. And so it makes me a Christian. He said, it doesn't work that way. I said, really? Well, how does it work? And he said, you see... God loves us with an unconditional love that we don't understand. And God wants us to love him back the same way. And the only way we have the ability to love God the way he wants us to is the reason he's given this thing called free will. We are allowed by God to choose whether or not we want to accept what Jesus did on the cross. And he said, if God didn't give us that choice, we would rebel against him. And if you look at the Old Testament, it's full of stories of Israel rebelling against God because he told them what to do. It's our human nature. It's the way God created us and designed us. So God leaves the decision and the choice up to us. I just got done, my wife and I just got done making a video that's going to be played at my funeral. And I was showing it to Rob. And it's, it's going to have this same message in it. God doesn't send anybody to hell. Ever. He allows us to choose where we want to spend eternity. And he honors that choice. So he said, in order to be a Christian, the first thing you have to do is you have to talk to Jesus. And you have to do, you've already admitted that you sinned. And folks, I don't think there's anybody in this room that would say, I've never done anything wrong. And he says, you have to do this thing that's called repent. And what repent means is to turn around and change your way of thinking of sin. He said, we have to go to Jesus and talk to him. And we have to repent for our sin. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you what I did with this fellow that uh, uh, Rob was talking about in a little bit and about how God works. But uh, he said, you have to first go to Jesus and repent and tell him you're sorry for your sin. God knows, folks, that that doesn't mean we're never going to sin again. You see, when you accept Christ, he not only forgives you for your past sin, but he, he forgives you for your present sin and your future sin all at the same time. So you only got to do this one time in your lifetime if you mean it, if you're genuine. He said, you got to tell Jesus that you're sorry for your sin. 
Then you have to tell them, I believe Jesus, that he died on the cross. And God put the sin of the entire world on Jesus' shoulders when he died on the cross. That does not mean everybody in the world gets to go to heaven because he leaves the choice up to us. And we have to choose where we want to go. And I'm going to give you guys a chance to make that choice. I'm going to ask you to make a, a decision tonight. And we'll get that to the end of my talk. But he said, you have, to, you have to tell Jesus that you're sorry for your sin and you want him to come into your life. You want to receive what he did on the cross for you. Come into your life and give your life to him and allow him to lead and direct your life from that point forward. And I said, how do you do that? And he said, well, I'd be happy to lead you in a prayer, but you have to mean it from your heart because God knows your heart. You see, Psalm 139 says that God knows every word that's going to come out of our mouth before it's on our tongue. God says, every day ordained for you was written in my book before one of them came to be. And it's funny, God's got these books. If you go to the to Revelations, uh, chapter 20 in Revelations, the great white throne judgment, it says, I saw the dead, great, small, stand before God, and the books were opened. God's got a book. He's got pages with your name on it in that book. Every sin you've ever committed is written down under your name. And you're going to be judged at that great one throne judgment by what's written in that book. But it also says that there's another book that was opened, and that's the book of life. Once you accept Christ as your Savior, that book that God's got, it's got your name on it with all the sins you've ever committed, he rips your pages out of that book, they're burned up, and he forgets them. And once your name's written in the book of life, there's no sins written underneath your name. That's your free pass into heaven. And it says, the ones who were judged according to what was written in their books, if their name was not written in the book of life, they were cast into the lake of fire, and that's a second death, an eternal death in, in hell. So, carrying the message. But let me show you how God works first. Okay? I'm going to need some audience participation here for this. You have a question? No. Oh, you're willing to participate? Oh, good. Okay, I'm always looking for some action. All right. Play along with me here. A deck of cards has two colors, right? Red and black, right? Yep. Somebody pick red, or, pick red or black. Red. Red, okay. That leaves black. And black, you got two suits. You got clubs and spades, right? Somebody pick clubs or spades. Spades, okay, in spades you got two types of cards. You got base cards and you got number cards, right? Pick a base or number. Okay, that leaves numbers. And numbers you got even numbers and odd numbers, correct? Okay, pick even or odd. Even. Even, okay, that leaves odd and odd. You got the upper odd and the lower odd. The upper odd would be the seven and the nine, and the lower would be the three and the five, right? Somebody pick upper or lower. Lower. Lower, okay, that leaves upper and upper. You got the seven and the nine, right? Pick the seven or the nine. Seven. Okay. So we end up with what? Seven of spades? Let me see here where I got this. What's written down on this page? Can you read it here? The seven of spades. The seven of spades. Okay. A couple of things here. Number one, I knew what the answer was. If I hadn't, we had a one in 52 chance of getting it right. The second thing is, there is only one way that I could not get you to say the seven of spades. That's if you quit the game. God does the same thing with us. We got free will. We get to make choices. God puts those choices in front of us. You guys got about half the answers wrong. I didn't want red. You picked red. I didn't want red. I wanted black, right? I didn't say, you're out. The game's over. You're done. I just said that leaves black, doesn't it? You say, yep. Okay, in black, you got base, uh, you got two two suits, clubs and spades. Somebody picked clubs. I wanted spades. I just said that leaves spades, doesn't it? Because God knows everything you're ever going to do in your life, He knows the sin you're going to commit after you accept Him. He's already made a plan for it. He knows His game. I got it from Him. The only, and, and he knows what your final answer needs to be. 
He doesn't kick you out when you get the wrong answer. He just said that leaves spades, does it? Let me see. Yes. Yep, it does. And the only way God can't get you to where he wants you to be is if you quit. If you give up on him, he can't do it. If you turn around and walk away from him. But as long as you stay in the game with God, it's okay if you get some wrong answers. He's still going to get you to the point that you need to be. Make sense? That is good. Okay. I want to tell you some stories about uh, what's transpired in my life with evangelism. Uh, I think about a fellow named Todd. Todd was a, a drug addict. Uh, I met Todd at, uh, in Buffalo, down at the park, and he was sitting at the, at the table, and I had these things at my house, or I did have, that I called Matthew parties. Uh, if you go back and look when Jesus called Matthew to be a disciple, he called Matthew to be a disciple. The very next verse it said that night while they were eating with tax collectors and sinners at Matthew's house, what Matthew did, he recognized who Christ was, and he invited all of his friends over to his house for dinner so they could keep it and introduce Jesus to him. That's a Matthew party. I had Matthew parties that I disguised as game feeds. And I'd go out in our lake. I had them in, in the wintertime. I, I did tons of hunting and fishing in my life and had a freezer full of stuff, and I'd go and fight these fellas. I lived right on, on the lake. I'd go out and invite fellas that were ice fishing over to my house that afternoon for a game feed. I would invite four or five brothers in Christ, and I'd invite a bunch of people that didn't know the Lord. And I did it as a mixer, so to speak, so they could get to know some guys that knew the Lord and start to establish a relationship, and they could find out that these guys were halfway normal. I mean, Rob wasn't there, so uh, <laughs> most of them were pretty normal. And, and we started a relationship. We built a relationship with Todd and invited him to all kinds of different things that we did together as, as brothers. We never never pushed him. We never did anything like that at all. We just developed a friendship with him. Four years after that Matthew party, he came to a retreat we had up at Camp Shamanoff. And a friend of mine who's a, a Assembly of God's pastor in Wisconsin was there to give a message. He gave a salvation message. And Todd came forward and prayed to accept Christ. That's evangelism. For evangelism, you don't have to go out and stand on the street corner and yell at people. You build relationships and let them know where you stand with the Lord. As men, God wants three things out of our life. He wants us to live a, a, a life of integrity. He wants us to live a life of humility. And he wants, to, wants us to live a life of transparency. Transparency is wearing Jesus in your shirt sleeve. When's the last time one of you folks shared Christ with someone? Have any of you done it in the, in the last day? Have any of you done it in the last week? How many have done it in the last month? The thing that keeps people, you know what keeps people from sharing Christ with your friends and your relatives? One thing. First John, 1 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all, right, all unrighteousness. 1 John also says, perfect love drives out fear. Fear is what keeps us from sharing the gospel with people. I used to be a general manager for Crystal Pierce Marine, and I was a director of sales for their corporation with all their sales training. We had a fellow. Uh, uh, Jason Moore was his name. He was a salesman in Fargo. And Jason was only closing about 20% of the people that he talked to selling the boat. When I sold boats for Crystal Pierce Marine, 95% of the people that I talked to the very first time bought a boat from me. Jason's battery average was about 20%. We went to Jason and I said, I'm going to make a statement, Jason. I want you to tell me if I'm right or wrong. He said, okay. I said, 80% of the people that you're talking to, you're doing a disservice to. He said, I disagree with you. Now, Jason, if you look at personality types, my wife and I did marriage classes for years, and we used Gary Smalley's material. Gary Smalley was a clinical psychologist who was a Christian, and he, he did these personality type tests, 
And he identified four types of personalities by four animals. A lion, a beaver, an otter, and a golden retriever. Okay, a lion is somebody that's a type A personality, real driven, and he runs over people, and you know that type. A beaver, my wife is a beaver. She's got a list of where she keeps her lists. A beaver's detail-orientated. I'm an otter. An otter's a fun-loving guy. I'm the guy who go out on the ice and say, it's safe, trust me. Jason was a golden retriever. How many of you know that personality type of a golden retriever? He won't say anything bad to anybody, and everybody he's ever met is his best friend. And people fell in love with Jason the first time they talked to him. Well, Jason was a golden retriever. But Jason suffered from nice guy's disease. And I'll explain that. I told Jason that you're doing a disservice to 80% of the people you talk to, and he said, I disagree with that. I said, okay, let me ask you some questions, Jason. I said, who, what boat dealership has a better product, product than we do? He said, nobody. We sold Plastron, we sold Ranger, we sold Bennington pontoons, we sold Ski Centurion and uh, Ski Boats, we sold Lund and Crestliner. We, for the type of boat it was, we had the best of the best for every line we had. He said, nobody sells a better boat than we do. We said, okay, who's got a better price than we do? He said, nobody. We, we sold enough boats for each manufacturer. They'd give us this price and nobody else could get, and they would do things for us nobody else could do. On a London Crestliner, they had two pedestal seats in the back, or, or one right in the middle in the back, and the problem with it, if you sat back there to fish, the motor was in your way. So we went to him and we said, would you build us boats with two, one on each side of the motor? They said, sure, nobody else could get them built that way. And they gave us prices that nobody, ever, nobody else had. We were always two or three thousand dollars less than anybody else in the market for that product. He said, nobody's got a better price than we do. Okay, who's got a better owner than we do that's gonna take care of the customers better? He said, nobody. Myron Kuyava owned Crystal Pierce Marine. We did $120 million of business a year. Myron gave every customer he had his card with his personal cell phone number on it. And he told them, if you ever have something you need done and my store doesn't take care of you, call me. I'll make sure they take care of you. And that was a real motivation for all of the store managers to make sure they took care of their customers. And he said, okay, Jason, what other salesman is gonna do a better job, care more about their customers than you do? He said, nobody. Okay, so let me get this right. We've got the best product, we got the best price, we got the best owner, and your customer gets to work with the best salesman in the business. So, you're selling 20% of your customers, 80% of them are walking out that door and going someplace else, and they're running into a salesman that's gonna sell them lesser of a product at a higher price, they don't get to deal with Jason, and they don't have a the the owner's personal cell phone number. So wouldn't you admit that that's doing them a disservice? He said, well, if you want to look at it like that, look at it like that. And I said, well, how, how would you look at it? Jason had nice guys disease. He was too afraid to ask the customer to buy because it was, he was afraid it was going to jeopardize the relationship he built with them if they said no. We do the same thing when it comes to sharing Christ. We're too afraid that it's going to cost us a relationship. We're too afraid that we're going to be embarrassed or that he's going to make us look foolish to reach out to somebody. Jason's customers, the most they had to lose was getting a little bit less of a product and a little bit of money. What do our customers have to lose if we don't share the gospel with them? They have to lose eternity, folks. We can't suffer from nice guys' disease. We can't do it. A number of years ago, my wife and I did marriage classes in our home. We had a couple that went through one of our marriage classes. It was a 13-week class, and about three months after the class, one of the, one of the couples, a husband called me, and, and it was about three o'clock in the afternoon, he said, Tom, would you go with me over to, I'll just call him Joe, to Joe's house. And I said, what's going on? He said, well, Joe and Sally, and Sally was the sister of his, his wife, who we did our marriage class, have decided they want to get a divorce. Sally told him she wasn't happy in her marriage and wanted a divorce. 
would you go over and talk to him? And I said, well, I will under two circumstances. Number one is that you call him and get permission from him, and he knows I'm coming, and that you go along with me. He said, okay. I said, I'm only going to talk to Joe. I'm going to have my wife Lisa call Sally and talk to her on the phone. So I went over there and I, I shared with Joe, and he'd never heard the gospel. I shared the gospel and asked him if he wanted to pray to accept Christ, and he said, yeah. I said, here's the deal, Joe. you got to do this because you want Christ in your life. This may or may not affect your marriage. You, Your wife may still leave you. You can't do this. You can't make a deal with God. you got to do it because you want to do it. He said, I, I do. And so he did. And she, his wife had accepted Christ in the past, but my wife talked to her, and we convinced them to go to some Christian counseling because we're not counselors. And they, they got an appointment, they went to Christian counseling, the things went on in their marriage pretty good for about six months. On a, on a Monday afternoon, I got home early from work, and we got a lake right across the street, I went out fishing, and I had to limit the crappies. And I just got done playing them on my phone rang, and it was the same dollar, he said, I need to have you go back and talk to Joe and Sally again. I said, what's going on? He said, well, on Friday, Sally told Joe about a, a pair that she had. And they're back at the point of really struggling in their marriage. And I said, okay, I'll go see them. I took the place I had because I'd given them a fish a couple of times and I went over to their house at six o'clock. And I, I knocked on the door and he opened the door and said, come on in. And I said, I was just thinking about you guys. I had some extra fish and wanted to drop it off for you. And so I gave it to him and he came in and, and he sat me down and he started telling me what was going on. And I listened for about an hour and a half and uh, to their story and stuff, and they said, guys, I don't have an answer for you because I'm not a marriage counselor, but I want you to go back to marriage counseling if you really want to make your marriage work. And I prayed with them and went home. 11.15 that night, my phone rang, and it was the gal, Sally, on the phone, and she's sobbing, and I can't understand what she's saying. The only thing I can make out, please come back to our house. I was a dispatcher when I got out of the Navy for the Dodge County Sheriff's Department and the most dangerous situation a, a deputy or a police officer can walk into is a domestic dispute. There's more shot and killed under that circumstance than probably all the other ones combined. And I'm saying, no, no, I'm not, I'm not going into I'm not walking into that, no God, I'm not going, I don't have anything to tell these people. And she's sobbing and begging and God's telling me you need to go, you need to go and I'm saying, I have nothing for this couple, God. I got nothing. And finally, God convinced me to go. And I said, look, I'll be over in about 15 minutes. I told Lisa, she's listening to the conversation. I said, you need to be in the knees to pray. I said, I don't know what's going on, but I've got to go back there. I walked in, and I said, what's going on? And he told me, he said, she told me about this affair on Friday. For three days, I've been begging her, is there anything else? Let's just lay everything out on the table. Right now, let's deal with it. Let's move on in our marriage. And she kept saying, no, there's nothing else. No, there's nobody else. No, there's nothing else. He said, well, when you left, she felt guilty. So she opened up and told me about two more affairs. One she's involved in at this time with the next door neighbor. I'm thinking, oh boy. And so on my way over there, I'm praying to God, God, please give me something to tell this couple. I'm not equipped for this. Give me something. I'm not equipped, and I'm getting nothing. We walk into their house, and I'm sitting on the sofa, listening to them, and she's spilling her gush. She's telling me all these details that I didn't want to hear about all these horrible things that she'd done, and he's listening to all of it, and finally he just said, I've been, this is one o'clock in the morning, he said, I've been begging her for three days to tell me, and she kept saying, no, 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 there's nothing else, there's nothing else. He said, she lied to me every time she said that, there's no way that God can put this marriage back together. And I still got nothing from the Lord. Finally, it's quiet for it seemed like an eternity. It's probably a minute that God said, give them hope. And so I said to Joe, I said, I want you to come outside with me. It was June. Beautiful night, not a cloud in the sky. And, I said, and he told me afterwards, he said, when you asked me to come outside, I thought you were gonna tell me to get a divorce. We got outside and I said, Joe, look up and tell me what you see. He goes, okay, I see stars. I said, no, look at that. He says, okay. I said, you know, God spoke one word anywhere in existence. 
I said, do you know the story when Israel left Egypt? How they crossed the Red Sea on dry ground? He said, yeah. I said, when they got ready to go into promised land, they crossed the Jordan, it was in the spring, and the Jordan was at the highest blood stage it ever been. And God dried that river up for 20 miles upstream, and they walked across on dry ground. I said, Lazarus, he was dead for four days. Jesus spoke three words. Lazarus come out, and he was restored. He said, I want you to think about that for a minute. And then I want you to look me in the eye and tell me that the same God that did that can't restore your marriage if you give him a chance. They're still married today. We got them. It's nothing I did. Nothing at all that I did. I was scared to death to go into that house. That was much more of a moment for me than it was for that couple. God will never, ever get you out on a limb and saw it off and let you fall. Ever. Amen. He will give you what you need, when you need it, if you'll trust him. He will never let you be embarrassed. I, I prayed with probably five or 6,000 people in my lifetime to accept Christ. Not a single one of them has ever cost me a relationship or an embarrassment or money, or anything. When God asks you to do something, you can trust him completely. You don't have to be equipped. You don't have to have the answers. You don't have to have any, you, you gotta have one answer, and that's the gospel. Yes. And that's all you need. Yes. To go out into this neighborhood and share with everybody you know that's all you need. When I got ready back in 1972 to accept Christ, this fella said, Tom, I want you to bow your head and pray with me. I'm going to ask you to do the same thing right now. And if it's your desire to accept Christ as your Savior, I want you to pray with me when I pray. You don't have to do it out loud. I'm not going to ask you to come up here. I'm not going to ask you to stand up. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm just going to lead you in this prayer. God knows your heart, so he knows if you're sincere. If it's your desire to accept Christ tonight, I want you to pray with me, Lord Jesus. I know I've sinned in my life. I know I've broken your law. I know you're a holy God. I believe the Bible's true based strictly on the facts that Tom told me tonight about. Okay? It's not a, just a good book. It's not a fallacy. It's not a fable. It's not just a good story. I believe it's true. I believe Jesus really lived, that he really died on the cross, and he really rose again. We have more non-biblical evidence about the life of Jesus than we do any other public figure that ever lived, that all of those things happened. I want to ask Jesus to forgive me for my sins right now. I want to repent, and I'll do my best to turn around yes. and walk away from a lifestyle of sin. Yes. I want Jesus to come into my heart right now and be the Lord of my life from this point forward. Yes. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Now, with everybody's head bowed and eyes closed, if it's your desire to become more influential, in your witness for Christ, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Jesus, I trust you completely. I want you to open the door for me to be able to share the gospel with my friends and relatives and neighbors. Please give me an opening and let me know when you want me to share. And I'm going to trust you, Jesus, even though I don't have the answers. I don't need them. All I need to know is the gospel. And I trust that you'll never embarrass me for it. It won't cost me anything. It won't cost me a relationship. And I want you to lead me and direct me as I walk people through that. And give them the same opportunity that you gave me to be able to spend eternity with you. Yes. And I praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. While your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, I want to do two things. If you prayed tonight to ask Christ into your heart, I want you.
want you to raise your hand for two reasons. Number one, I want to be able to pray with you. I see your hands. I'm going to pray for you over the next couple of weeks, as long as I have left on this earth. The second reason is, is that Jesus said, if you'll acknowledge me before man, I'll acknowledge you before my Father. If you don't acknowledge me before man, I won't acknowledge you before my Father. And if you pray the other prayer with me, I want you to also raise your hand because I want to pray with you over the next couple of weeks. I see your hands. Thank you. Jesus, I pray for everybody to raise their hand to receive you. Your word says that angels in heaven are rejoicing right now. So yes. those people that raise their hand, yes. I pray that you would protect them. I pray that you would make yourself real to them in a way like they have never seen before through your yes. Holy Spirit. Your Holy Spirit just entered them and your Holy Spirit is going to teach them. When they open the Bible and read your word, they're going to have a new grasp of your word. And I pray for those that raise their hand that they want to be a more effective witness. I pray you protect them also because Satan does not like what's going on here tonight. Yes. And he's going to do everything he can to steal that yes. from them. Protect them, Lord. Yes. Give them opportunities. Help them to be an evangelist for you in this lost and fallen world. And I praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Yes. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. I want to ask you one more thing. I want to, I want to ask you to pray for my wife. Uh, you know, this cancer that I got, they've assured me that I'm not going to be around in two more months. I've got a really close friend that his wife was a veterinarian. He was an adult ministries pastor in Buffalo, Minnesota. They got called to Sudan to be missionaries three years ago. Three days before I got my diagnosis, he died of a heart attack. 53 years old, had four kids in Sudan, his wife was in Sudan. He didn't get the opportunity that I have. This cancer is a gift for me. Yeah. None of us are going to get out of this world alive. Not a single one of us. I got the opportunity to be able to hold my wife's hand and walk her through this with me. I had the opportunity to say goodbye to the people I love and my friends. Tomorrow my wife is having them. I'm sorry. I told you this is emotional. Tomorrow my wife's having a 70th birthday party for me. I've never had a birthday party in my life and she planned this since, since January. It's going to be a birthday party and it's going to be a chance for me to say goodbye to the people I love. Pray for my wife. Please. She's a very independent woman. She knows God and loves God. But she's going to really struggle letting people into her, into her life to help her. I covet your prayers.